Chapter 14. Explanation of the different kinds of divine visions enjoyed by the Queen of Heaven and the effects which they wrought in her. The grace of divine visions, revelations, and raptures, I do not speak here of the beatific visions, although they are operations of the Holy Ghost, must be distinguished from justifying grace and from virtues, which sanctify and perfect the soul in their operations. As not all the just nor all the saints necessarily have visions or divine revelations, it is evident that sanctity and virtuousness can exist without these gifts. It is also evident that revelations and visions are not dependent upon the sanctity and perfection of those that are thus favored, but upon the divine will. God concedes them according to weight and measure for the ends which he wishes to attain in his church. God can without doubt grant great and the most exalted visions to those who are less holy and only inferior revelations to those who are of exalted sanctity. The gift of prophecy and the other gifts freely given, he can give to those even who are not saints. Some of the raptures, moreover, can arise from causes which have nothing to do with moral virtues. Therefore, if any comparison is made between the prophets, their sanctity does not enter into calculation, for that can be estimated only by God. But the divine light of prophecy and the mode of receiving it must be made the basis of the comparison as to its being more or less exalted in its different aspects. Thus it happens that charity and virtue, which make their possessors holy and perfect, depend upon the will, while visions and revelations, and likewise some of the raptures, affect the understanding of the intellectual part of man, the perfection of which does not in itself sanctify the soul. Nevertheless, Though the gift of divine vision is distinct from holiness and separate from it, the divine will and providence very often joins them according to the end and object in the gratuitous gifts of special revelation. For sometimes God ordains them for the public benefit and for the common good of the church, as the apostle tells us. Thus the prophets inspired by the Holy Ghost and not filled with their own imaginations spoke and prophesied to us the mysteries of the redemption and of the evangelical law. When the revelations and visions are of this kind, they are not necessarily joined with sanctity, for Balaam was a prophet and no saint. But generally it suited divine providence that the prophets should at the same time be saints, preferring not to deposit, at least not easily and frequently, the spirit of prophecy and of divine revelations in impure vessels. In some instances he, as the all-powerful, did choose to act in this manner, yet, not to mention many other reasons, he did not ordinarily wish to derogate from the power of his divine truths and teachings by the bad life of the instrument. At other times, the divine revelations and visions do not pertain to things of so general an import, and they do not concern so much the common good, but only the particular advantage of the one who receives them. Just as the former are the effects of God's love toward his church, so the latter, the special revelations, are the results of the special love of God towards the particular soul. He communicates them in order to instruct his chosen ones and in order to raise them to the highest grade of love and perfection. In this kind of revelations, the spirit of wisdom transcends through successive generations of holy souls, making them successively prophets and friends of God. Just as the efficient cause of the revelations is the love of God shown to some particular souls, so also their final cause or object is the holiness, the purity, and the charity of these very souls. God chooses this means of divine revelation and vision in order to gain this end. I do not therefore say here that revelations and visions are the indispensable and necessary means for the making of the saints and the perfect. Many are such by other means, irrespective of their benefits. 
But even supposing this truth, that the concession or denial of these particular gifts depends solely upon the divine will, it is nevertheless also a fact that on our part and on the part of God there may be certain reasons of propriety which induce God to communicate them more frequently to his servants. The first among several is that the most proper and convenient means of rising to eternal things, entering into them, becoming spiritualized, and arriving at the perfect union of the soul with the highest good, is the supernatural light concerning the mysteries and secrets of the Most High, which comes from revelation and vision granted to it in solitude and in its excesses of mind. For this purpose, the Lord himself invites the soul with many promises and caresses, as is oft times shown in Holy Scripture, and especially in the Canticles of Solomon.